Um, the clarinet is basically just a cylindrical uh, wooden tube uh, with finger holes so that as I take more fingers off the instrument, uh, the pitch will rise. Like that. And a lot of met metal keys in order to enable me to play all the notes in between those notes, the chromatic notes. And some of that metal work is to enable us to play trills, for example, quite rapidly and efficiently. Now, if I didn't have the key on the side of the instrument, that trill would come out like this. Which not, might not particularly please either the conductor or the composer. So a lot of this metal stuff, although it looks complicated, is actually there to simplify matters for us. In order that we don't have to carry uh, a case around which is as long as this instrument, particularly as we usually have to carry two, the instrument takes a part. Um, and you can see there is the bell, which is the end of the clarinet, called a bell because it's bell-shaped, obviously. You then have the main part of the clarinet in a lower joint and an upper joint. And then at the very top, we have a barrel and the mouthpiece and reed on the mouthpiece, which go on the top of the barrel. Well, if you go to an orchestral concert, you may have sometimes wondered why you see the clarinetists uh, with two clarinets, whereas all the other members of the woodwind section have just the one. Um, and you'll some, sometimes see us change quite rapidly from one to the other. Now, this isn't because one of the instruments has suddenly become worn out, or indeed that we're trying out different instruments in the concert. Um, it's just that because of the nature of the fingering system on the clarinet, uh, most composers write for two different clarinets in order to avoid us playing in complicated keys. So we have a B-flat clarinet, which is the shorter one, and an A clarinet, which is the longer one. Uh, I'll just put a mouthpiece on so that you can hear the difference in pitch. So if I finger the note C on my B flat clarinet, it comes out as a B flat. And if I finger the same note C on my A clarinet, it comes out as an A. So we have to be careful to get the right instrument to do that. Um, sometimes composers ask for a very, very rapid change from one to the other. For example, Bartok in his trio Contrasts, which we've recently recorded as part of the Philharmonia's Bartok series, Bartok asks for a change that's this fast. As you can see, I slightly fumbled that change, and if that was a concert, I would definitely have missed it. So uh, you have to be pretty nifty with some of these changes. That also um, brings up issues with the conductor, because obviously if we're concentrated on a complicated change of clarinets, uh, we can't watch the conductor during that time. Obviously, we've got bars rest, but those bars rest might be quite complex. If it's Stravinsky, all the bars might be in a different time from one another. So we'll quite often ask the conductor after we've had a change, excuse me, could you be sure to give us a clear cue at the end of that? Sometimes in a concert, you may see clarinetists adjust their instrument at the barrel by slightly pulling out or pushing in to adjust the length of the instrument. This is because we may have noticed that either one or two of our colleagues or possibly ourselves or somewhere else in the orchestra something has slightly changed in pitch and we need to microscopically change the pitch of the instrument in order to adjust that so that the sound reaches the audience bang in tune. Now the reed, which is a quite simple piece of wood, you see at one end it's a piece of cane which has been cut so it tapers to a very, very thin tip. So thin I can even put it on my thumbnail and it will show flexibility. So the very end of the reed is very flexible. 
it means that when I put the reed against the mouthpiece, there's a small gap to blow air down, but small enough that when that air goes through the instrument, the tip of the reed will vibrate, and that's what makes the sound. Now, it's very important to get the right sound, that the reed is absolutely right. And you may sometimes, particularly if you come to a rehearsal, see clarinetists surrounded with what might look like hundreds of reeds in order to find the right one. Um, it can be a bit of a nightmare for us because a different concert hall may be less resonant than the next one, uh, which means that a slightly different resistance of reed is required to make just the right sound. Um, if I play a reed which is too unresistant for a hall, you can get quite a rough sound. On the other hand, if the reed is too resistant, you can probably hardly get any sound through it at all. And that can vary from venue to venue. And playing in an orchestra where on tour, we may go from hall to hall, even country to country, different atmospheric conditions from day to day, one usually needs to carry a selection of reeds in order to choose exactly the right one to get the right sound in the hall on that particular day. That might sound like a terrible nightmare for us, but, of course, if things don't go quite right, we can change the reed. And as flautists, horn players and trumpeters uh, are constantly saying to us, of course, if their lips don't feel right on a certain day, they can't change them, can they? Yeah. Um, the way we produce the sound, obviously, uh, to get a basic sound, one blows through the instrument as warmly as possible. <laughs> Now, if I blow the air through the instrument far more slowly, the sound will become softer. And if I blow the air through the instrument very fast, you'll get a louder sound. So, although on the face of it, you might think that an instrumentalist has to work harder to play loud than to play soft, in fact, it's exactly the reverse. Because if you think about it, things that are moving slowly are harder to control than things that are moving fast. So, to play, for example, a very high note softly, the air is moving very slowly and one has to be very careful to control it. In fact, that very note has just featured in one or two of our Beethoven concerts at the end of um, Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, third movement in the trio. So one has to be quite careful to control that last note because it's so soft. Obviously, once you get behind the instrument into the player him or herself um, it's quite hard for an outsider to see what is actually going on you can see the fingers move you can't see what's going on inside the person's mouth um, in order to make the reed vibrate properly we curl our bottom lip over the bottom teeth but the top teeth go on the top of the instrument and we then have to close the mouth so no air escapes <laughs> although some contemporary composers have actually started to ask specifically for a very breathy sound. Uh, the Argentinian composer Maurizio Cargill uh, asks for various uh, different categories of breathy sound, half breathy, breathy and so on. So we have to actually nowadays learn to be able to control what we spent all our student years trying to avoid completely. Now, uh, I've played so far just long notes. If we want to play a series of separate notes, and you see I blew down the instrument several times separately then, but that sounds rather breathless and unmusical. So what we do is to use the tip of the tongue against the reed to stop the sound, interrupt the sound, uh, which will enable us to keep the air going and play a number of repeated notes more musically. And one can, by using that method, play extremely short. 
uh, there's a passage in Beethoven's Fourth Symphony where he asks the bassoonist and the clarinetist to play a very, very rapid staccato. <laughs> Uh, which can be a nightmare in a concert if it doesn't go quite right. Of course, not if it does. Um, so that's an example of quite fast tonguing, and there's a separate t tongue stroke for every one of those notes. <laughs> Obviously, uh, in, an, in an orchestra, you'll sometimes get all the instruments of the orchestra playing together in what we call a tutti passage, where everybody's playing at once, uh, sometimes making a very, very loud sound indeed, but sometimes the whole orchestra can also play very quietly together, which can be quite exciting. Uh, the woodwind instruments, of which the clarinet is one, uh, will be playing a part in that, but also uh, the woodwind are quite often asked to act as soloists uh, within the orchestra. So we'll sometimes be playing as part of the group and we'll sometimes be playing, as it were, as the lead part or as a soloist. For example, the opening of the finale of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. <laughs> We're playing very loud indeed, so you would imagine that the clarinets would be heard, but the trumpets are playing at the same time, and in any orchestra with a decent trumpet section, with a, which of course the Philharmonia has, uh, there's no chance whatsoever of hearing the clarinets. You'll hear trumpet sound and a, a general tutti sound around it with the trumpets leading. Um, at the beginning of uh, Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, the clarinets play this. Now, the first part of that, I was part of the tutti sound, and you probably wouldn't hear the clarinets at all. But the second part of it is a clarinet solo. The clarinet has the lead part. So although Beethoven writes that to be played very softly, piano, I'm actually playing with quite a healthy, warm sound in order to be heard as the lead solo part. If you've enjoyed learning about the instruments in the orchestra, why not try our iPad app, The Orchestra, featuring Esa Pekka Salonen and the Philharmonia Orchestra. Fully interactive video playback lets you view the orchestra from all angles, and the revolutionary beat map shows you who is playing when. Follow along with synchronized scores. Hear the inside scoop in audio commentaries and get a 360 degree view of all the instruments. Available for download in the App Store on iTunes.